Today we'll be discussing the periodic paralysis syndromes. So essentially these syndromes have in common the presence of sudden onset, usually short-term episodes of muscle weakness or paralysis. When I say short-term, I mean usually minutes to hours, although sometimes these episodes can last for days. Usually in between episodes, patients will recover completely, although as time progresses, permanent weakness can start to occur. And people with periodic paralysis syndromes usually present in the first or second decade of life, so at some point before they become adults. And this condition is due to variance in one of three types of channels. These are the potassium channel, sodium channel, or calcium channel. And what I'd like to illustrate is that ions, in particular, have a very important role in muscle contraction as well as muscle relaxation. So what we're looking at here is a schematic of the muscle cell. And what we can see is that there's a variety of ions, these charged molecules that need to move into or out of the cell for the muscle to be able to contract properly. So we can see here we have sodium, we also have potassium, and then finally we have calcium that we have see here. There's also other ions such as chloride, which can be implicated in other disorders of muscle contraction. There are three main periodic paralysis syndromes, and those are shown here. So they can be classified both by the genes involved as well as by the serum potassium levels during an attack. So hypokalemic periodic paralysis is the most common type of periodic paralysis. It's due to variants in either a calcium channel or a sodium channel. That's the S for sodium, C for calcium. As the name suggests, for hypokalemic periodic paralysis during an attack, the potassium level will be low. Okay, compare that with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis where the serum potassium is going to be high during an attack. And then distinguishing features, so low potassium levels in the blood can cause a prolonged QT interval. And that's dangerous because it can provoke life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. Next is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. This is due to variants also in a sodium channel, SCN4A. Potassium levels during the attacks are typically high. So if you take in too much oral potassium, either electrolyte drinks or bananas, things that have a lot of potassium in it, you can trigger an attack if you have hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. And then last on the list is anderson wheel syndrome. This is due to variants in a potassium channel. That K is an abbreviation for potassium. Here, the potassium levels during attacks are going to be variable. So there's no clear association high or low with the potassium levels and the attacks of weakness. The distinguishing features of anderson wheel include craniofacial and skeletal anomalies. So those include hypertelorism, a small jaw and low set ears as well as scoliosis, short stature, syndactyly, and then fifth digit clinodactyly. Also important to note, very important, is that anderson wheel syndrome has a prolonged QT interval at baseline. Right? So in between attacks, the QT interval is going to be prolonged, as opposed to some of the other syndromes where typically the, there's going to be an arrhythmia, it's going to happen during the attack and not necessarily between the attacks. So to make the diagnosis of a periodic paralysis syndrome, the best test to do is to send genetic testing. You also want to consider sending the patient for an electrocardiogram to look for the prolonged QT interval that you can see in anderson wheel, as well as an electromyography study via something called the McManus protocol. This is specific for testing for periodic paralysis syndromes and can help, particularly if the genetic testing is negative. 
Management includes correcting the potassium levels if you have hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis in the acute setting, and then avoiding triggers. So for example, avoiding taking in too much potassium, especially if you have hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Management is usually done by neurology. And in anderson wheel syndrome, you also want to consider referring patients to cardiology and developmental pediatrics. In some cases, patients with anderson wheel also have mild learning disabilities or mild intellectual disability. The differential diagnosis is quite interesting for periodic paralysis syndromes. Many of these disorders listed here on this list have an association with an ion channel of some sort. So for example, alternating hemiplegia of childhood, patients typically have hemiplegia, which is almost like a paralysis, but just of one side of the body. And that's due to a variant in the gene ATP1A3, which encodes a sodium potassium ATPase pump. Episodic ataxia can be associated with episodes of weakness as well as ataxia. It is due to variants in a potassium channel. Autosomal recessive myotonia congenita can present with muscle weakness that's provoked by rest, and it's due to variants in a chloride channel. Thyrotoxic periodic paralysis is a consequence of hyperthyroidism, which can lead to hypokalemia, and it is life-threatening. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also subscribe to my monthly newsletter with board-style questions for genetics exams. And you can also buy me a coffee to show your support for the channel. Thanks.